kitchen below the looking glass with photographer Jennifer Hayes. And if you were with us for the previous presentation, you might know Jen as part of the photographic team of Dubelay and Hayes. You get some sense of their personalities and very different approaches to work from this quote on their website. Photography is memory and thought and composition and dreams, says David. And trial and failure, trial and failure, says Hayes. Opposites truly attract. Together, they have logged nearly 40,000 hours underwater and 15 years of marriage to produce stunning photography and stories for National Geographic. And in the ultimate boy meets girl story, they first met underwater watching a lemon shark give birth. But it's a delight to consider Jen as a solo storyteller. Our colleague, former director of photography, Sarah Lean says, Jen Hayes is fearless. She is one of the most dynamic and selfless photographers I have had the pleasure to know. Jen is all about the work, telling the story, and making sure that you see and understand the beauty, the urgency, and the miracle of life on this planet. Our mutual friend Buffy told me, a dairy farm in upstate New York is not the first place you'd imagine being the home of an aquatic biologist and underwater photographer. But from day one, Jen has made the unexpected happen. She snorkeled in the fresh water of Lake Ontario before she ever dipped a toe in salt water. But that fascination with all water and particular passions for elasmobranchs and living primitive fishes led to graduate degrees in zoology and marine ecology. But Jen is ultimately a person who sticks to places and subjects. And although she has traveled the world, home, that upstate county and a few subjects are dearest to her. In her words, I have learned a thing. We finish and leave stories all the time, but some stories become engraved in your being. Maybe it's because you enter a story at a turning point, you are the witness to the moment, and it becomes impossible to look the other way. There are two species from which Jen cannot walk away. Possibly the ugliest and the cutest species on the planet compete for her attention, sturgeon and harp seals. It's something in that attraction of opposites. Few things get Jen more excited than those dinosaurs known as sturgeon. Says Jen, I fell in love with this group of dinosaurs. And you cannot tell the story of a fish that lives for decades in one trip. So when Jen is not collaborating with David, she chases her own underwater challenge those dinosaurs in the fast-moving, turbid waters in the St. Lawrence River. It's safe to say that no one has documented them as fully as Jen. She has known some of these fish for over 20 years, and knowing her, she will stick with them for another 20, if not more. As David says, she left the research, but never the story. Another obsession for Jen has been the unfolding impact of climate on harp seals. She returns year after year hoping that this will be the one time that the ice holds, that the pups survive, that we can see a reversal of the changing seascape in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In fact, as soon as Jen leaves Sharjah, she will head north to those ice flows for a month with fingers crossed that this year will be different. It may be a little farther north than usual. Now I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that Jen is a community volunteer, a driver for Meals on Wheels, the most loyal friend and a dedicated animal rescuer. I had trouble getting a bio from her because she was busy retrofitting a doghouse for a feral cat ahead of plunging temperatures and a snowstorm. It was easy to forgive that delay. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer Hayes to the stage. Holy schmoly, Kathy. It's some intro. I can't see a thing. Oh, yes, I can. I can see Stephen Wilkes right there. There he is. So, where to begin? Sharjah. Can you believe this place? Oh, my God. It's an incredible place for photography and photographers. I walked in. I was gobsmacked. For once, I was speechless. 
that's hard to do. Anybody that knows me, <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. So, um, what's in the title? What did, we, what did we call this? We called it Through the Looking Glass. That's a title you come up with when you're under pressure and Simon says, I need a title. And you're like, that's true. We're going below. That's where we're going. We're going below to do some storytelling. And where I want to take you first is um, I want to tell you some good news. What's happening out there like, like a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. This is three weeks ago in Antarctica. This is Ralph Lee Hopkins on one of the Lindblad, NG Lindblad ships in Antarctica. And everybody saw these spouts, one, two, three, and then mount, just miles and miles and miles of spouts. These are fin whales. This is up to 1,000 fin whales in Antarctica that are fishing krill. Okay, we've seen, we've seen Brian's We've seen Brian's whale work. Why is this special? Because every last, every last fin whale was fished out of the Antarctic along with the memory of how to get back to the Antarctic. So the arrival of these fin whales here is nothing short of a, a rediscovery and a rediscovery of pathways. They're back! And this was the first time a gathering of this size had been seen. And this is what they look like. Or maybe not. There we go. This is what they look like. Five miles of fin whales. This is good news. They found their way back to their ancestral feeding grounds. And someone was there to capture it. All right, another piece of good news that I talked about, that I sprung on Kathy today in our, in, in our summit, was a discovery of this ice fish nursery. This is, this is 60, 60 million fish, each a meter and a half long, each on their nest. You can see some dead ones there because Weddell seals have come down and predated on them. Matter of fact, it was the Alfred Wagner Institute that wanted to take credit for the discovery, but I'm giving it to the Weddell seal because it had a transmitter. It led the Alfred Wagner Institute there. And this, this field, this nursery is the size of Morocco. Had been there, had been there, had been there, had been undiscovered. I ask you, I say to you, we know nothing. What do we know? We have only opened the door on the sea, not even a door, a window on the sea. And while I, I work with them, um, I talk to some of my colleagues at the, at the Wagner Institute because I graduated with a couple in graduate school and they've gone there. And what I like about the Wagner Institute is that they give these images away. This isn't thieved. They put, they make their discoveries, they create the science, they document, then they put it up and they want, they want this shared. They want scientists to share this, they want storytellers to share this, they want emerging scientists to learn, see, do, get excited. And who is the pipeline into the science, the storytellers, and the emerging, the emerging stakeholders? We want to know, we want to find them. I'm big on next generation, ask David, I'm huge on next generation. If you've got somebody that that we should track as they, if they have an investment or an interest in the sea, we want to follow and we want their voice. What we're trying to do in every single meeting is we talk about next generation. Oh, the solution is all in it. Who's not in the meeting? Who aren't we hearing from? Next generation. So we went out there to give them a platform and give them a voice. We followed Mont Marine, or we, we followed a group called the Scuba Knots. This is one of our one of our first go at it. Followed the Scuba Knots to Mont Marine Lab, and these guys have more credentials than we ever will. I promised I would give them a voice. I'm giving them a voice.
Hi, I'm John Zisco. I'm part of the Tampa chapter, and we're out here with Combat Wounded Veterans and Mount Marine Laboratories to do some coral out plants, and um, I think it's really good because the corals are in desperate need of help. Hi, my name is Brayden Estes. I'm with Scuba Knots International, and today we're going to be planting coral. that I think it's important to do this is because people of my age, many of them may not know about the importance of our oceans and I think that getting out there and setting an example is a very good thing to do. It's difficult, and I'll stand back behind the microphone so you can hear that. Give them a chance, listen to them. We talk about them in, in I, I don't know, 45, 50% of our meetings. I wanna hear what they have to say, not what, what's around the round table. So we're going to them and we're stalking them actually from East Coast to West Coast and we're submerging with, with the different groups. If you know a group that I need to know about, I wanna know about it. You can find me. And another thing we're doing for Next Generation is we're creating what I call, it's a hashtag, what's your nature? So we're taking these one minute modules that we're, we're getting uh, natural history either from the, uh, I'm filming on uh, Lynn Blanchett, wherever I can, I call it guerrilla filming. And we're sending these into the classroom to give kids a chance to, to discover their nature. And this is, this is South Georgia, this is a a place, uh, St. Andrews Bay, it's the largest king penguin colony, one of the largest, it's not the absolute largest in the world. It's not just about kings, it's about Gen 2 penguins and chicks. It's a piece of compelling, it's a piece of compelling nature that gives kids, a, kids attention and they want more. So they go off and they, they leave your piece and they explore more and that's the whole point of this. What's your nature? So we're going to jump into the world of the penguin. And the whole point of this is to inspire kids to learn more. Like krill. Everything in the Antarctic either eats krill or it eats something that eats krill. And kings coming home from, an, from a day at sea. And then you get, a lot, you, you get a lot of kids reaching out after that. What was that penguin doing? What is that? Why do they live there? Why do they do that? And they engage. And in South Georgia, it's not just about penguins. It's about pinnipeds. Here is an imaginary conversation. One would like, I ask, I ask kids all the time, what, what do you think that conversation is? If you, can, if you can guess, tell me. So fur seals are, are born in South Georgia in November, and they're not the only pinniped. There's leopard seals, there's elephant seals, there's fur seals. And we're using fur seals in this case because they are a good news story because in the way back days, in the way, way back days when there was hunting and whaling going on in South Georgia Island, yes, they took the very last fur seal on South Georgia. But guess what? There was a relic population on another island a bit of a distance away that actually when the hunting stopped, when the hunting stopped, the seals came back and now they are back to their original numbers. And I like sharing that in classrooms because it gives kids hope.
to know that all is not doom and gloom in their world because they're getting a lot of it. So we're giving them a little hope as we go. And then we take them in into the world of the fur seal at about their age. These guys are young fur seals socializing. One minute modules, what's your nature? If you know something that we should get out there and film, let me know. I'm gonna go and we'll drag it into a classroom. Another thing that I am really big on is collaboration. Collaboration, 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 and amplification. So what we did is uh, David and I joined a group called the Elysium, well, it was three expeditions. Started, it started in the Antarctic, so it's the Elysium Antarctic Expedition the Elysium Arctic Expedition, and the Elysium Coral Triangle Expedition. Okay, was this just photographers? You know, we go out, we're just photographers or videographers, or we might, we might even just deign to take a writer. No, who are we when we go out on these Elysium expeditions? Are you ready? We are photographers, we are filmmakers, we are scientists, we are writers, we are poets, we are musicians, we are sculptors. Everyone goes. The, the expeditions average about anywhere from 50 to 70 people. What comes out of those expeditions are, and they're all volunteer, we go in our own time, we create a body of work that consists of a book, an exhibition, and a film. And what we're trying to do, and there's always a youth or a younger or an emerging, an emerging component on there. We're taking emerging photographers, emerging storytellers, emerging scientists, along, along with the established, like, you know, we'll pick up Sylvia Earle, we'll drag her out. But what we're doing with this content, with this collaboration, is we're not putting it in museums. We're taking it where we think it's gonna do, where it's gonna be seen. We are taking it into the malls of China. So we went to China, and we went to Beijing, Shanghai, and Chengdu, and we found out the most popular malls. So when kids come to buy Nikes, this is what they see. And maybe they take a little bit more home than Nikes. They have a little star power from the local country to open it up. Collaboration. We're trying to get them. We're not asking them to come to a museum. We're not asking them to come to an exhibition. We are parachuting in on them outside of their favorite store. We're stalking them. So, okay, let's go. Let's go to a story. One of David's and I, fairly recent stories, if I can get this to, to advance. Here we go. Was on Sargassum. I had to choose. You're limited to time. Could we do Night Sea? David was doing reefs, so I chose sargassum because this started out as a boring old story about sargassum weed. We were just going to go. This weed appears all over the ocean, but it, it appears dense, densely in the Sargasso Sea, the Bermuda Triangle, if you will, where ships used to get sunk and sink, and that's what, what all these, these ancient 
stories of lore have it with sailing ships would get trapped in the Bermuda in the Bermuda Sargasso Sea and the Portuguese called it Sargasso and it's named for the grape it's a grape like bladder it is a floating seaweed that never touches the ocean floor and it is also an amazing sealing community an amazing nursery area a predator prey hunting ground it is also something that we avoid like the plague we just always drove around it we avoided it and finally we decided to explore it in a story called sargassum and we simply were going to stay in the sargass in the sargasso sea off bermuda to go and discover and look at and define the ocean community here, the ecosystem, to look at what we have long time residents. This guy is, this guy is a angler fish who is designed specifically for, for the weed, not only by camouflage, look at his toes. He lives in the weed his entire life. And this little sargassum angler fish is actually a voracious ambush predator. He is the predator. He waits for something to swim by, equally his size, and then hover, and then he consumes it. And then there's other predators that, like this ocean triggerfish, that are there and they hunt and look and do and see turtles. It is a nursery area. It is where everything that is big in the ocean goes to grow up. It is there for the vulnerable, it's there for the hunter, it's there for the hunted. It forms on the ceiling of the sea, it lives and dies and is driven by wind, ocean, or wind and currents. What might be an enormous hectare of weed one day will spread out when a wind comes through and be smaller pieces that then gather back together. It is also, it, it sequesters carbon, so we're really, really paying attention to it now. It is not as, it is not the carbon sink that seagrasses and mangroves are, it's about 11% of that, but we're really paying attention because when it sinks, it takes the carbon with it to the bottom and we need, we need that to happen. But like on any other story that we've done in the past, I don't know, David, maybe a decade, <laughs> 10 years, if we don't start to cover, cover climate change, it finds us. What happened on this story is explosive growth of this sargassum weed began to appear off South America and it made its way across the Caribbean. Look at this, this is a raft of sargassum. That's our boat to give you some reference. This is a raft of sargassum. There are five in a row in this. They are like aircraft carriers coming across the Caribbean Sea. Why? Why is this happening? Increasing temperatures, increasing nutrification. So we left the Sargasso Sea, we, we left the angler fishes behind, and we started chasing climate change because you have to. We pivoted and we started chasing the story. So here, for perspective and fun, is the size of a single raft of weed using a drone. That's an amazing ecosystem for marine life at sea. Okay, so there's parallel ones. It literally is like the D-Day landing. Coming across the Caribbean, beaching on the Windward Islands, driven ashore, creating havoc. Like you say, underneath, it's an oasis of life. It's incredible. It's the sounds, the, the hunt, it literally, animals are at the edge of it, above it, in it, around it, looking, hunting, trying to eat, trying not to be eaten. And let's take a look in it. So it really forms a ceiling on the sea and schools of fishes love co cover. It's called literally a FAD, a fish aggravating device created by nature. Now, weed gathers on the weed line driven by wind and current, which is also where the whale sharks feed, and they try to avoid ingesting it. When it comes ashore, this is where the story is. What is magic at sea and magic nursery area comes onto the beach, it smothers the beach, it smothers sea turtle nests, it smothers waterfowl, and this is what we find, dead sea turtles.
And now Mexico is in the multi-billion dollar development of how to stop it from coming to their beaches because it is wiping out not only their environment, but also their ecotourism. And when you mess with that much money, you find a solution. So we are also chasing weed and how they're going to deal, deal with this. All right. So Kathy mentioned, I'm going to take you to my, to my favorite place. This is actually the St. Lawrence River and the Thousand Islands on the St. Lawrence River in Clayton, New York. This is three minutes from our house. If you ask David, he'll tell you we live here. It's actually just a few minutes from our house. This is Bolt, this is Bolt Island Castle in the St. Lawrence. And I'm going to introduce you to one of our coolest neighbors we have on the St. Lawrence River. Meet the sturgeon, the lake sturgeon. Kathy gave you a little bit of a hint that I might be slightly obsessed with these. I am. This is Miss Chippy. I met her back in the 90s when I was working on my graduate work. She's got a divot in her back where she was either hit by a boat or a hydro prop. We don't know. At the time that I'm swimming with her, she was 76. If I do the math, I'll know how old I am now, so I'm not going to do that. I think we figured out at one point the oldest sturgeon I handled we, did, we aged and James Polk was president when that particular one was hatched. They live over 100 years old. They get to be seven, six, seven, eight feet long in the St. Lawrence River. And they, these long life fish do not spawn until they're 20 to 25 years. So can you imagine when you start extracting these guys and they have these complicated sex lives that their populations fall apart pretty quick. 27 species around the world. All 27 species are in dire trouble. They are by far the most threatened group of fishes on the IUCN red list. They top the list. They are also pound for pound the most valuable fish with a female, with a female sturgeon bearing caviar up to $3 million on the poach market. This will give you an idea of the size of the beluga. This is in, this is in London. This would have been a Caspian Sea sturgeon and actually really held out only for the royal family at the time. So with all of them falling off the planet, we started a restoration project in our own home waters, and it was my, I kicked it off with my research in 1995 by basically harvesting the first egg to be cultured and put back into the St. Lawrence River. And we found out that 25 years later, we, we, are, we are winning. So, Kathy, you called them ugly. You did. Okay, I'll give you that. So, to me, they are so ugly, they become, they become incredibly beautiful. They have more in common with sharks than they, do, than they do bony fish. They are a bony fish. They have no bones in their body, like sharks are cartilaginous. They have those barbels that go along, they're sensory barbels, and they go along the bottom and they figure out, they run over something they want to eat, and they don't have teeth. They have a tubular mouth, and then they have a grinding pad. This is an ancient, ancient, ancient design left over from the dinosaur days. These guys swam with the dinosaurs, and somehow, they somehow managed to survive the mass extinctions that killed all their aquatic cousins. They are the swimming ancients among us. And as this female took off, she, she had dropped all of her zebra mussels, which are an invasive species, which is also good to know that they're consuming our invasive species, dribbled them over my head and went on to the spawning beds to spawn. I go down on the spawning beds every June for about five days. I get one five-day window a year into their secret lives. It's when they're so pumped up on hormones, they don't know who they are and they don't care who you are either. So you harness in and you go down on the spawning beds and you get to visit these sturgeon on their terms. Once I locate a group of sturgeon, I will settle in a few feet away and just wait, observe and watch. Okay, I'm going to confess, I'm obsessed with sturgeon. They're one of the coolest species of fish on this planet. They're called the dinosaur fish because they swam through the mass extinctions that killed most of their aquatic colleagues. It's my time on the bottom of the St. Lawrence with a dinosaur fish. How rare is this? There are 27 species of sturgeon and 27 species of sturgeon are in dire trouble. 
Sturgeon have complicated sex lives. They may not mature until they're at least 25 years of age and then not spawn every year. They may spawn every five years. But when they do, it sounds like thunder. It's incredible. Every year, I look forward to this. We also collect eggs and sperm without injuring the fish. And the fertilized eggs are taken to a hatchery where they will grow from June to October into fingerlings. And the fingerlings are released. And it is amazing to watch these dinosaur fish released into their future. So in the St. Lawrence River, and let's see, six, six tributaries, part of our restoration plan that started in 1995 included, included seeing spawning, spawning sturgeon in 25 years. So we are now at success in five of those tributaries after 25 years. And I can stand here and say, I saw the first one go in and I saw the first one spawn. And that's, uh, we might want to call that long form journalism. I'm not really sure what to call that. But this is what it's all about. We're introducing next generation sturgeon and we're also bringing next generation kids along with us to release the sturgeon and to know that they're stakeholders in their future so that they understand that these sturgeon, this, this is Ben and he's five years old and in 25 years from now, those sturgeon will spawn. And we try to impress that upon the kids. This is what 7,000 sturgeon look like when we release them into each tributary. They, they, they leave the trucks that come in from Wisconsin. They, they start to feel and sense their, their environment. And then they start to head out on their own and head out into new sturgeon lives to do secret sturgeon things and to grow and hopefully in 25 years show up again and begin to rebuild the native populations. So we have a victory and I, I couldn't be prouder of it. All right, I want you to listen. Just listen. It's underneath the sea ice in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, beneath the harp seal herd, beneath the nursery. It sounds, it sounds more like a tropical rainforest than, than a tropical rainforest to me when I descend there. This is the harp seal nursery in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. The females will come up on the ice in late February. We're here now, uh, waiting for the ice to form, but she'll crawl, she'll, she, and the herd will climb up on the ice in late February. And this is what the herd like, looks like. This is approximately one patch of 10,000 seals. We call it the herd. They search for ice. They come down from the Arctic in November. They populate the Gulf of St. Lawrence. They eat, they feed, they socialize. And then in February when the ice, in January when the ice begins to form, they note it, they choose their patch of ice and the herd hauls out, starts to give birth in late February. And it's usually a unison birth. There's a pulse that happens with maybe a few early and a few late, but generally they give birth literally on the same day. The wind is relentless across the sea ice. There's nothing to stop it literally from coming, from sweeping across from the, from the Arctic down. The seals need need to get out of the ice and any windbreak will do anything something the size of a tennis ball a shoe a, a bread basket or like this pyramid of ice itself is going to work really well for this guy as long as it stays upright and not down on him and what happens is the females will come on and they'll give birth this is a newborn still wet with its amniotic fluid hasn't nursed yet She will give birth, she'll rest. 
and after some minutes, a few minutes, she'll begin to nurse him. Now what I have to do, because he's discovered my camera, is get that camera out of there because we don't want him interested. We don't want to distract him from his first nurse. The females will nurse the young for 12 to 15 days, a whole 12 to 15 days, and then the mother is going to, she's going to abandon the pup on the ice after that 12 to 15 days. But before that happens, she's going to come and go. She's going to feed the pup. She's going to go down beneath the ice. She's going to eat. She's going to come back up. She's going to try and teach the pup to swim if ice conditions allow. And then after 15, 16 days, she's going to disappear. She leaves that pup to figure out how to be a harp seal all by itself. It needs to learn how to swim. It needs to learn how to eat. It needs to learn what to eat. It needs to learn how to be a harp seal. And natural mortality is high based on that particular natural history, based on the biology, their, their mortality is high. When you add to that climate change and the loss of sea ice below, it's catastrophic. So our last day of the assignment on our first season there in 2011, we decided to go out and add to the pictures. David found his seal. There he is, and I don't have my own seal, so I go off looking, I find my, there he is, there's my seal. So David's got his, I have mine. This is gonna be a good last day. And I have him looking at me, he's saying, are you my mom? No, I'm, mom's behind me. This is mom, meet mom. Mom's not happy that I'm between her and her pup. She's looking at me and she decides to do something about it. So she swoops around, she comes around, comes past me, she meets her pup with a nose to nose, to nose kiss of recognition. Are you my mom? Are you my pup? And she coaxes him off the sea ice. She's going to move him from his small piece of ice. She's going to move him away from the crazy lady with the camera. So they start swimming, and I keep a polite distance away from the harp seal and the mother because we let wildlife approach us. We don't approach the wildlife. So we're swimming, and we're swimming. And the pup wants to come to see me. He's really curious, like, what is that shiny thing? What is, and he wants to come. But you can see the mother harp seal literally is physically holding the pup back. No, we're not going to go see the crazy lady with the camera. We don't know what she is. We don't know what she'll do. And after spending some time in the water, we're going along and I'm going along and I'm shooting a, a polite distance and keeping up with them. She relaxes. And you can see, she's keeping her eye on the pup, but the pup is getting a little closer to me. You can see he's curious, and she's like, okay, you can go on your own, but I'm gonna keep an eye on you because I don't want you to get in trouble. We swim a little further, and the pup gets even closer. Here he is, now he's at my elbow. So now the pup is literally right here on my elbow, and then he climbs, gets more purchase and more, and then before I know it, he's literally on my chest. He's on my chest, and he's resting. And then he starts to do that nose-to-nose -nose thing to my mask. And mom, in the meantime, is circling us like, what are you doing to my pup? What's going on? I don't understand the situation. She's giving me stink eye. He rolls off my chest, and she goes and she checks him out stem to stern. What'd she do? What was that like? Did anything happen? What, are, you, are you intact? Is it all good? And I'm watching this and I'm photographing it like a maniac because it's our last day. And it's our last opportunity to get this behavior that we hadn't gotten before. And I'm, I'm photographing and then I, I feel a nip on my left ankle. And then I feel a nip on my right ankle. And I look down and I see about 20 male harp seals circling around below me. And I think, oh, Okay, Mario Sierra, our guide, had explained that to me once. He, he said, the males, they test you. You're swimming with their girlfriend. They're full of testosterone. Nothing to worry about. And I had that thought. Nothing to, when a male harp seal came over my head, the friction took off my mask. I sunk down. My mask dropped. I had to duck dive to get it. And I'm very floaty in my dry suit with my weight belt. Let me get down a little bit. I get the, the mask put back on my face. It's filled with seawater and mucus. I can barely see anything. And I look down and I see the male harp seal like this, about 10 feet down, looking back at me. And I said, that might not be good. And I'm trying to get a better view out of my, my junked up mask. And I felt this whoosh go by me, this whoosh. And I get a frame off. And it's the female going by. She goes down and she beats, she beats the heck out of the male. 
they turn around, there's, there's flippers, there's bubbles, there's fins, and there's this circular, circular mess, and then the male swims off. And then the female comes back up, she's coming up just like this, really, really slow, and blowing plate-sized bubbles. And I'm thinking, oh, that might not be good. But what she do? She goes to her pup. She checks him out, stem to stern, stem to stern. Are you okay? And then she begins to push the pup through the water. She begins to nudge the pup using her head, her body, and her nose. And she gets halfway, like let's say halfway to the, to the bleachers over there. And she stops and she swims back. And she comes behind me and she starts nudging me through the water. And she nudges me with her head and her body and her flipper. And she gets me to where the pup is. And then she begins to nudge us both. She's nudging us both to the edge of the ice. We get to the edge of the ice and she disappears down an opening called a lead. It's about three feet wide where the ice can come to together so quickly it's not a safe place to be. I look around the corner, I watch them disappear. I can't believe myself, I'm so cold, I can't think straight, I, I can't process what just happened. I'm putting my, my camera up on the, on the ice shelf to get out of the water. I'm getting ready to undo my belt and I, just as I'm getting her, a male harp seal comes underneath that ice and he bites me square in the groin. Boom! And he lets go. And then he bites me square in the thigh. Boom! And he lets go. And before I know it, I'm standing on that ice. We know why he was there and why he bit me. I was swimming with his girlfriend. Why the female seal, why the mother seal did what she did, I'm going to leave that up to you. But... Let me take you into the world of the harp seal for a glimpse. That guy's called a yellow coat. You can still see the yellow tinges of amniotic fluid and nursing next to the mother's, the hole that she'll go up and down. And below is this incredible, incredible cathedral of ice where the mothers disappear to and they have, they, it's like an entire community under there in communication. We're now sending hydrophones down to record the communications and to isolate conversations and communications. So, in 2020, that was my last season there because because of COVID, 2021 Canada was shut down and in 2021 there was absolutely no sea ice and it was catastrophic for the seals. This is what it looked like March, March 4th in 2020 with the sea ice breaking up, it's warming, the temperature's going up, the wind is picking up, it's fracturing and fracturing and fracturing and fracturing the sea ice, the sea ice nursery. And four days later, this is what it looks like. Unsustainable for the harp seal pup. As a matter of fact, that's a, that's a mother next to a pad of ice with what was her harp seal pup. So, I'm simply gonna wrap this up with an invitation that if you ever get a chance to go to Magdalene Island, you too can go out to the harp seals. You can stay at a hotel and they will ferry you out by helicopter, and you too can meet the face of climate change. Grandmothers, grandfathers, families, cancer survivors, new married couples, divorced couples, they all go, you're invited. I'll see you there. Thank you. <laughs>